Welcome to the ASWE Workshop 2021 with Workshop ID 13615. The Evolution of Tools in Enabling Effective Remote Laboratory Delivery in Engineering Curricula. This is your pre-workshop lab video to help you in conducting a laboratory experiment before attending the workshop. I'd like to acknowledge Robin Getz and Mark Thorin as my colleagues from Analog Devices. I'm Dr. Robert Bowman and I'll be your presenter today for the lab video. In terms of our workshop goals, we wish to acquaint you, the workshop participant, with self-directed learning in electronic design. And we'll do that by using a small portable USB powered instrument referred to as the M2K module from Analog Devices. You'll complete a laboratory exercise in your home environment before attending the workshop. That's the reason for this pre-workshop video. During the ASWE workshop, either in person or online, you can share your experience that you had in completing the lab exercise in your home environment using the small instrument module and parts kit. And then we'll explore some advanced topics in electronic design and test, such as network and spectral analyses. The pre-workshop lab video will provide an introduction to the lab exercise. In other words, what do you do, what do you need to do with this lab at home? We'll start by looking at the general topic of electronic bridges, including the Wheatstone Bridge and the Wien Bridge. We'll then examine the performance characteristics of operational amplifiers. Both non-inverting and inverting gain configurations. We'll then discuss the interesting topic of sinusoidal oscillators. We will look at the Barkhausen criteria for establishing sinusoidal oscillation and techniques for amplitude stabilization and reduction of harmonic distortion. We will use the analog device's M2K test module and parts kit, and so we'll provide an overview of that. And then we'll proceed to build a Wien bridge oscillator and building it and testing it. Then we'll have some advanced topics for self-directed exploration. So what do you need to do in this lab at your home? Well, first of all, you need to make sure that you have the analog devices M2K module and the analog devices ADLP 2000 parts kit, which is provided to the first 50 individuals to sign up for this workshop. Now these modules and part kits are provided courtesy of analog devices, so we would like to acknowledge their support in this workshop. In order to get the module set up, you can go to the wiki address shown on the screen here, and it will give you instructions for downloading and installing the drivers, plugging in the M2K to your computer with a USB cable, and installing the multifunctional Scopy software that converts your computer into a powerful test instrument. Let's begin by taking a look at electronic bridges. In the early 1800s, the idea of a balancing or ratiometric bridge had been discovered, and it was developed by Charles Wheatstone to measure unknown values of resistance and calibrate instruments. Now you can see by this electronic diagram that the bridge consists of essentially two voltage dividers, R1, R2, and R3, R4. And this bridge network has an interesting property in that we're really allowing ourselves to get to the point where there's no voltage difference between nodes C and D. When we do that, we call that, refer to that as being having the bridge balanced. Really what that really means is that the ratio of R1 to R2 has to be exactly the same as R3 and R4, 
in order to accomplish the balancing exercise. Uh, for example, if we say that R4 is our unknown resistor, and we're going to use the Wheatstone bridge to determine the value of R4, we have an established R1, R2 ratio on the left side of the bridge, and then we also have a variable but known resistor that we can use to adjust to balance the bridge. So for example, if R4 is our unknown resistor, R2, R1, and R3 are known. R3 is a variable but known resistance when the bridge is balanced. We can show that the bridge is balanced or when the voltage across the voltmeter is equal to zero, the ratios of R2 over R1 plus R2 and R4 over R3 plus R4 must be equal. They're just simple voltage dividers. But because they're in this sort of bridge configuration, we're balancing the ratios of the two resistors instead of just doing a simple voltage divider to determine the value of a resistance. From this expression, we can therefore calculate the value of the unknown resistance as equal to R2 times R3 divided by R1. So when we adjust the value of R3 to balance the bridge, or we'll realize no voltage between nodes C and D, we have balanced the bridge, and we now have an expression for determining the value of the unknown resistor R4, which we're calling Rx. Now compared to a simple voltage divider, the bridge uses a differential measurement technique, sometimes referred to as ratio metric, to eliminate the large DC offset that would be associated with a simple voltage divider. Now we can extend this idea of bridge measurement to reactive elements. The Wienbridge circuit shown in the figure was developed in 1891 for the purpose of accurately measuring capacitor values. So you can see we have two capacitors here in this what we call Wienbridge network. We'll talk about some of the interesting properties about that in a minute. But one of these capacitors would be unknown. And so we'll designate R, our C1 as being the unknown capacitor. And then we also have a variable resistor that we're going to use to balance the bridge to allow us to determine the value of the unknown capacitor. To find the unknown value of C1, for example, when the other component values are known, an AC signal is applied, in this case a sine wave signal, is applied to nodes A and B, which appear across both sides of the bridges. And we can use R1 as a potentiometer or a variable but known value resistor. Now, as we continue to vary the frequency of the sine wave, we will reach a point at which nodes C and D will be equal. Vm is equal to zero. When the ratio of the resistances R3 over R4 matches the ratio of impedances formed by Z1 and Z2. Now, we can also rec recognize that Z1 impedance is a high-pass filter, and the Z2 impedance is a low-pass filter. So their intermediate node point will experience a resonance, a natural resonance, and that will also lead to an, a peaking in the impedance at that node. So we recognize that using this high-pass filter and low-pass filter combines an interesting combination with the high impedance developed at node C. Now at the resonant frequency of omega sub r, omega sub r squared will equal to 1 over r1 c1, r2 c2. Therefore, we have a way by using uh, the expression c1 over c2 is equal to r4 over r3 minus r1 over r, r2 over r1. So this now provides us a way of determining the unknown value of c sub x. So basically, we're using the Wheatstone bridge that we used before but now we've included reactive elements so we can determine the unknown values of capacitors. Now, we mentioned that the Wien bridge consists of this series uh, RC network and parallel RC network, which has the interesting property that when the frequency reaches the resonant frequency of this network, it reaches a peaking in amplitude, and that peaking in amplitude is, has an effective gain between A and C of one-third. Also, we notice that when we reach that peaking or resonant frequency, there is a zero degrees phase shift experienced between A and C. 
okay? So these will become important properties as we develop something called a Weinbridge oscillator. Now, recall that even though we're down here at minus 9.54 dB, that really is 20 times the log of one-third, okay? And we said that before that when you reach resonance, the voltage at this point relative to node A will be one-third of the value. All right, now let's take a look at operational amplifiers or op amps. This is the symbol that we typically use for an operational amplifier. It includes both power supply inputs, which are bipolar inputs, V plus and V minus, typically balanced supplies, an output signal from the amplifier, and an input uh, pair of, of lines that consist of what we call a differential input. So the difference between the two inputs is multiplied times the gain of the amplifier to provide the output. Now, some ideal properties for operational amplifiers, which in many cases can be approximated very closely, is infinite input resistance, zero output resistance, zero common mode gain, which means that if the signal coming in on the minus and the plus are in phase and of equal value, we should not expect to see any signal at the output because the amplifier is trying to amplify just the difference between the two signals. It has an infinite differential gain. Now, of course, nothing has infinite gain, but we can get that, that gain high enough that for practical circuits, it looks like it's very, very large. And then finally, infinite bandwidth. Well, of course, it's not going to have an infinite bandwidth, but once again, if the amplifier is used in applications where the bandwidth is well known and large compared to the surrounding components, then it holds for a pretty good approximation of an ideal operational amplifier. Okay, let's take a look at operational amplifiers with feedback. Here we're taking a look at the ideal op-amp non-inverting negative feedback configuration. What do we mean by that? The signal, our input signal, gets injected into the plus input. The feedback network is surrounded around the output to the minus input and relative to ground. Okay, so this is the configuration for a non-inverting, which means that the signal itself will not experience a 180 degrees phase shift relative to the output. It will be in phase. So let's take a look at this. Well, first of all, the thing that we're calling VID, or the differential input, is the difference between V plus and V minus. And therefore, the output is A sub D, or the differential gain of the amplifier, times that VID. Now, if AD can approximate a very, very large gain, then we drive the difference between the two inputs to zero. Or another way of saying that is the inputs are equal. V minus is going to be equal to V plus, which we're going to call V sub I. Because if the, if the inputs between the two differential inputs is relatively small, that means that whatever appears at V sub I is going to appear at V minus on our op amp. So V minus is going to be equal to V plus is going to be equal to V I. Now, we have an expression here for two, two nodal equations, IR2, which is the current that flows back through R2 relative to this not, uh, in, uh, inverting input, will be V out minus VI, because we know that the VIs are the same here, divided by R2. Okay, so the differences in voltages between the output and the input node divided by, by the resistance is going to give us our current IR2. Now, the input voltage, then, is going to be equal to IR2 times R1, because we know that that flows across resistance R1. Now, by taking these two expressions and solving for IR and solving for VI and this expression for IR2, we can come up with a gain expression for V out over VN, which is gain, is equal to 1 plus R2 over R1. Now, this is very interesting. What this is telling us is that whatever the ratio is between R2 and R1, for example, if it's a ratio of 10 to 1, then the output voltage is going to be 11 times as big as VI, 1 plus the ratio of R2 over R1. We will take advantage of this non-inverting feedback configuration. Now, oscillators are sort of an interesting branch of circuits. For anybody who's done any kind of design in their, in their life, you realize that there are times when you get oscillators when you don't expect them. For example, if you're trying to build a high-gain amplifier, 
and you look on the oscilloscope for no signal in, you're getting a signal out. Well, that's an indication that the amplifier is oscillating. And so just when you least expect to find an oscillator, one shows up. Now, when you want to build an oscillator, it's not that easy. They don't show up spontaneously. You actually actually think about something and understand the criteria that are required to establish sinusoidal oscillation. Let's take a look at this diagram. This is a diagram of a typical feedback circuit, and we will try to examine the conditions that are required to sustain sinusoidal oscillation. I'm showing X sub N here as a signal that we're showing being brought in. That will not necessarily physically be a case as an input. We'll discuss that in a second. Anyway, the difference between the signal that's being fed back from our frequency selective network and the summing junction at the input of the amplifier will then be summed at this node here. And that node voltage, or whatever that signal is, current or voltage, will then be amplified by the amplifier and provide signal XO. Now I'm showing a switch here because when the switch is open, it provides us a way of actually calculating something called the loop gain. We're not going to talk about that right now. Just assume that we have the switch closed and uh, we can examine what we would expect to see in terms of a transfer function between the output and the input. Now the bar causing criteria states that for a feedback system to sinusoidally oscillate, the phase around the feedback loop, right here, must be zero degrees. In other words, whatever signal we pick up and, amplify and frequency select through this feedback network must in of itself be in phase with the incoming signal. That allows us to sustain oscillation at that resonant frequency. And the loop gain also has to have this loop gain here. In other words, if we just measure by opening the switch, the gain between 0.2 and around to 0.1, that loop gain must be greater than unity because that's the only way we can start the oscillator running by feeding a signal back on itself. So as a result, if we solve for the expression here, the amplifier gain with feedback, showing the subscript here, is going to be the amplifier's intrinsic gain divided by 1 minus A sub S, B sub S. This is referred to as the loop gain. So that's the condition where we have the switch closed. Now the frequency of oscillation is set by the phase response of this feedback loop, or in this case, the frequency selective feedback network. Even with no external input, in other words, if X sub N is zero, the system will oscillate when the magnitude of the loop gain in the frequency of oscillation is equal to unity or the loop gain ASBS magnitude is equal to one. Now we will discuss the origin of the oscillating signal later, but it's interesting to note that this system, if it satisfies the criteria of zero degrees phase around the loop and a loop gain greater than one, that system will oscillate. So just a, uh, some, a note here to help you come up with this expression. Notice that A sub F of S is really XO over XN. That was with the loop closed. We can solve for that XO equal to AS times BS times X of zero plus X sub N. And then finally, X sub zero times one minus A sub S, B sub S by gathering our terms here is going to be equal to A sub S times X sub N. And then if we solve for A sub F of S, which is really what? X O over X N. We gather our terms up here and we notice it's going to be A sub S divided down by one minus the loop gain, A sub S beta sub S. Okay. Just that a, some, a little bit of mathematics there to show you where this expression comes from. Okay. Now we're talking about synthesizing something we call a Wainbridge oscillator. Okay, well, first of all, notice that we're going to synthesize this circuit by taking advantage of the Wayne Bridge. Okay, so the frequency selective network we saw in the previous simple example is going to be our Wayne Bridge. So the series RC filter connects into a parallel RC filter, which at the node junction gets tied into our plus input of our op amp. Now, now, the gain of this system, as we have understood, the gain between V out to V plus for a Wien bridge is about 1 over 3 or 1 third at the resonant frequency. 
In fact, that will occur at the peaking point in terms of the amplitude response. So if it's ever going to oscillate, it'll pick that peaking point first because that's going to be the one that has the most gain around that frequency selective network. But we said that the gain from here around to here must be greater than 1. Therefore, we count on our negative feedback path for our op amp to establish our effective gain sufficient or what so that the loop gain is greater than 1. So how can we do that? Well, here I'm going to show you something that's a little more complicated than what we showed before because we found out that the gain through the non-inverting input of the op amp was 1 plus RF over RI. Well, what is RF? RF is right here, R3 plus R4. And that number relative to R5 plus R6 will establish the gain seen going from the plus input to the output. Okay, so what would that be? Well, if we take a look at this, we can see we have a 10K and a 4.7K. You can ignore the diodes for the time being here. <clears throat> if we adjust this resistor carefully, we will get to a point where the ratio of those two resistors will be equal twice as big as those two resistors. Okay? That means our effective gain looking in here is 1 plus 2 or 3. That means that the signal goes from here, experiences a gain reduction of one third, and then sees a gain up of 3 going from here to here. We now have a loop gain of 1. So we've, we've established the loop gain of at least 1 in the bar cars and criteria. Now we add these diodes at the end here to provide amplitude stabilization that we'll talk about a little bit later. Okay. How do we achieve this loop gain? Well, notice that the Weinbridge oscillator uses positive feedback. In other words, whatever signal appears here, if it happens to be at the resonant frequency of the bridge, is going to be in phase with the signal that originated it. Okay, that's number one, because we've learned that the frequency response of the Weinbridge has an amplitude reference of one-third, but of zero degrees phase shift at this point. So the resonant frequency of the bridge will occur at the peaking point, And that V plus over V out is going to be equal to one third. So we're going to experience a one third loss in our frequency from here to here. And the phase will be zero degrees. Now, in order to achieve the loop gain of unity or greater, then we have to use those two ratios RF to R, R ref. As, as we learned in the non-inverting voltage gain equation. So this means that the ratio of R3 to R4, R3 plus R4 relative to reference resistance R5 and R6 has to be slightly greater than 2 if we want the system to oscillate. As you can see, we can achieve this by making the resistance R6 a value such that when added to R5 is less than one half of the value represented by RF. Or if RF is 14.7K, the combination of R5 and R6 must be less than 7.35K. So we look on the output and adjust R6 till we see a sustained sinusoidal operation. Okay, now. This business of sustaining a sinusoidal waveform has to be thought through. You might ask the question, where's the input signal to the system? And we saw that X sub N in that previous slide. And I mentioned the fact that you don't even have to have an X sub N physically appearing in the system for the system to oscillate. How is that possible? Well, all solid state devices exhibit broadband noise and the system will select the frequency of that noise that satisfies the Barkhausen criteria. The op amp is filled with active devices. And so you're going to have a noise source of a broad spectrum of frequencies. So the frequency selective network chooses the frequencies that satisfies the Barkhausen criteria, and the system will oscillate at that frequency. Now the loop gain is usually set slightly greater than one, so we can readily achieve the oscillation. However, as the system continues to gain up the signal, the waveform approaches the voltage limits of the amplifier and starts exhibiting some nonlinear effects. 
This introduces nonlinear distortion. Now amplitude control is required to minimize this distortion, and this is accomplished using two diodes, D1 and D2. Now there are many different ways of stabilizing the amplitude. This just happens to be one of them. Now notice that what happens is as the waveform starts to grow sinusoidally and the waveform peaks start getting to the point where the voltage that's normally across R4 is become sufficient to start forward and reverse biasing these diodes, we will then see the diodes kick in and start to shunt the effective resistance of R4, which means you're going to start cutting back on the gain. So this is one way that when somebody can use uh, nonlinear elements like the one in 914 diodes to kick in and start shunting the effective resistance of R4. And you'll notice that as you adjust the gain setting here, when you just reach the threshold of oscillation, you'll, you'll have the diodes kick in somewhat, but they won't be dominant, okay? And so you wouldn't expect the harmonic distortion introduced by the diodes to be significant where the setting on the resistor or the potentiometer just allows the system to oscillate. But as you continue to increase the gain of the system, you will notice that the influence of the diodes becomes more prominent, and as a result, additional harmonic distortion is recognized. Now here's a great historical note. William, William Hewlett of Hewlett Packard fame developed a wing bridge oscillator for his graduate thesis at Stanford in the late 1930s, which used a tungsten filament lamp in the position of R6 here, pretty much in that position. Now the tungsten filament exhibits a positive temperature coefficient, meaning that as the temperature of the filament increases with increased voltage across it, it becomes more resistive. Therefore, a high amplitude signal on the output would show up across that tungsten filament lamp increase the resistance and back off on the effective gain because we know it's the ratio of this resistance relative to that resistance. And this would increase the effective resistance and therefore reduce the gain of the circuit. Now this work became the basis for HP's first product, the HP 200A audio oscillator. And guess who was the first customer? Walt Disney for use in the film Fantasia. Okay, let's take a look at our personal test lab. The analog devices M2K module and Scopy software form a powerful combination, as you can see here. And so this replaces your oscilloscope signal generator and power supply in a conventional uh, workbench. So here's the M2K module. Here's the Scopy software. And you turn your computer into a, a pretty powerful laboratory instrument. We call this the personal test lab or the backpack lab because this thing is relatively small. You get a parts kit that's not very large in, a, in terms of a plastic container. And the two form what we call the backpack lab. You can ca literally carry these things around anywhere with you to perform experimentation, as long as you have your laptop. So let's take a look at this M2K module. What is it? Well, it's a handheld. USB powered instrument. It has a two channel oscilloscope, a two channel waveform generator, 16 channel digital logic analyzer with supporting pattern generation and virtual digital IO, a single channel voltmeter for AC, DC, and plus or minus 20 volts, a network analyzer so you can do Bode, Nyquist, and Nichols plots, a spectrum analyzer. A digital bus analyzer for SPI, I squared hour, UART, and parallel interfaces, and two programmable power supplies a plus supply from 0 to plus 5 volts, and a minus supply from 0 to minus 5 volts. This thing is about the size of a deck of cards. Now, in this particular lab instrument, we're only going to be, lab exercise, we're only going to be using the analog portion of the MTake 2K module the oscilloscope, waveform generator voltmeter, network analyzer, and spectrum analyzer, along with the two pro pro programmable power supplies. So how do we access the instruments inside this small module? Well, there's something called a flywire cable that comes with the instrument, 
In this case, it's separated in two sections, what we call the analog section and the digital section. And because we're only going to be using the analog section, when you plug the instrument, the flywire cable into the back of the instrument, you only want to be on the left side where the numbers start 1, 2, 3, 4, and so on up along the line there. Now, as you can see here, channel 1 on the scope, the positive lead on channel 1 is the origin lead. Because it's a truly differential input to the scope, the negative side or the opposite side of the differential channel is connected to scope channel 1 negative. So those two lead constitute the input on scope channel 1. Likewise, scope channel 2 is accessed with the blue and the blue-white lead. The black leads designate grounds for the system, and a number of them are provided because they're quite useful when you're prototyping circuits. We then also have the power supplies here. The red lead is the plus 5 volts. The white lead is the minus 5 volt supply. And of course, those supplies are variable between 0 and 5 volts. We also have our waveform generator. The yellow lead is waveform generator number 1. The yellow white lead is waveform generator number 2. Once again, another series of black ground leads. And that defines our analog side of our system, okay? So, the personal test lab two-channel oscilloscope has a number of features that you would find in a standard laboratory instrument. The time base goes from 10 nanoseconds to one hour per division. It's an analog scope that has an effective bandwidth of around 50 megahertz. And you can have all kinds of different functions available in the scope like you would have on a standard laboratory oscilloscope. Likewise, the signal generator, or sometimes referred to as an arbitrary waveform generator, also has two channels, uh, 100 mega samples per second up to a 16 kilobyte buffer depth. You can develop complex waveforms, like a constant DC waveform for use as maybe another power supply. Uh, AC waveforms with customizable parameters like sine, square, and so on. A buffer signal that you can import from a file if you want to generate a custom signal here, for example. And then finally, you can use a mathematical operator to define a signal by mathematical equation. For example, if you wanted to generate an amplitude modulated waveform, you can do that by equation. Now, in terms of custom instruments, we can see that there's an array of instruments beyond the oscilloscope and signal generator, including the spectrum analyzer and network analyzer, and a voltmeter and power supply. So the network analyzer allows you to perform uh, frequency response characteristics like Bode plots on uh, frequency dependent networks. The voltmeter here is a standard digital voltmeter. Makes it very easy to make voltage and current measurements. The spectrum analyzer is, allows you to do spectral analysis and we will use that when we want to analyze the harmonic distortion being generated by our sine wave. Now, when you open your little blue box, you'll see these items in your blue box. You'll see your flywire cables. There's two of them. One you use for the analog side. The other one which you will not use for digital experimentation because we have no digital performance requirements here. And then you have a bag full of uh, pins that you will use to allow these test leads to be inserted into the prototyping board. And you also have a USB cable that allows you to connect the ADML uh, 2000 to your computer. So you want to remove that. Here's your M2K package includes the MTQ module, the connecting cord, the two multi clarid flywire cables, and a bag of test pins. So you want to remove the M2K module and cabling from the blue shipping bag and the electrostatic package. You want to connect the M2K module to your computer using the USB cables, and then you want to begin installing the Scopy software. You can find that quick start guide at this wiki page address. You can clearly go in and Google ADML 2000 and it will steer you to the same address. So you want to install the drivers and the Scopy software on your computer as indicated by these directions. You want to put the MTake 2 module from the shipping bag and of course connect it to the computer. And then you want to start the Scopy software on your computer and connect 
the computer USB port to the center USB micro connector on the MK2 module. You'll notice if you look at the back of the module, there will be a USB connector as you look at the back on the right hand side, which you won't use, but you'll use the center USB module, micro USB uh, connector for connecting the M2K module to your computer. So this is what it looks like after you've installed the Scopy software. You'll see when you uh, actually have the Scopy connected to, uh, installed on your computer and you've connected the M2K module to your computer, you'll come up with this diagram that says, hey, welcome to Scopy. And it shows an icon of your M2K module. You're gonna wanna click on that module and you'll get something that says, I am now connecting to the module it's going through a calibration procedure. And when it's finally finished, you've been calibrated. Now you have a disconnect if you want to disconnect the module from it. But you're now in a mode where you can actually operate the instruments. Now, you can ex ex export images and data that you collect on your oscilloscope by using the print command here in the upper left-hand corner. And you can save this either in a spreadsheet form or as an actual waveform image for use in documentation in a lab notebook, for example. Now the personal test lab allows you to save your workspace. Your workspace will allow you to store all of the information that you completed in your laboratory work in a file that saves all of the configuration and device readings. And you do that by using the save command. Now you want to give it a file name that you can retrieve and remember in the future. And the way I like to do it is to say, okay, let's say we decide to use the format ASEE2021 underscore your last name. And then it'll put the .ini extension. So use that as your name. So if I was taking this workshop, I would save the workshop exercise as file name ASEE2021 underscore Bowman. And of course, the diet I and I would be added automatically as the file extension. So that would be stored away in some designated location that you want. And then that file will be easily retrieved upon using the load command when you arrive at the workshop. We will now introduce the circuit build portion of the Weinbridge oscillator. We begin by recognizing the schematic that we have to build. And we also see that we have a quad op amp package, the OP484. We will use one of those op amps in this build. Now you have all of the parts that you need for this schematic diagram to be built. You'll build them on something called a solderless breadboard, which we described briefly previously. You'll notice that these pins that show up in rows are all connected together. So this becomes a convenient bridging point between the terminal of this resistor and the jumper wire that shows on the board. You also notice that the spacing between these rows on opposite side of this column here are exactly the spacing you need to plug in a dual inline package. And so we'll show you that when we give you the lab video portion uh, following these diagrams. Now identifying the parts required for this lab are highlighted in this table. So for example you're going to need three 10k ohm resistors. Each of those have a color code of brown, black, orange. Two 4.7k ohm resistors, yellow, violet, red. These are all in your parts kit now. The potentiometer, which is a 5K ohm potentiometer listed with the label as 502 in this blue package. The diode 1914 is hard to read, but you can identify these diodes because they're glass encased and there will be four 1 and 914 sort of taped together. You're going to want to pull two of those apart. The capacitor is a 10 nanofarad capacitor. Now these are relatively small. And the labeling is a little difficult to read, so you'll need to have some kind of a magnifying lens and a good light to read the label 103 that stands for 10 nanofarads. You'll need two of those capacitors. The op amp is the OP484, which we mentioned previously, and that's a 14-pin dual inline package. And you can carefully read the name, uh, the symbol for analog devices, and right left to that is a little 
depression dot here on the upper left hand corner of the package that designates pin number one all right right there is pin number one and then finally you'll use an array of jumper wires anywhere probably between seven and nine jumper wires which are also included in your parts kit i'll also mention that there's a small screwdriver that you can use to make the adjustment on the potentiometer this is the circuit build and circuit verification for our laboratory workshop you see in front of you the actual breadboard with the components and jumper wires taken from your parts kit as well as the M2K module and also the schematic diagram to the right in which we'll want to do correspondence between the physical layout and the schematic diagram here we're pointing to the operational amplifier and you can see that it's pretty much underneath a maze of wires because our jumper wires and the leads from the M2K module uh, tend to hide components beneath it. So we're going to take a different approach so we can do a more clear uh, representation. Here we see two different views of our circuit. We see the schematic diagram which represents the complete circuit and we also see the physical layout in a photograph below the schematic diagram. And so what we're going to do in order to make sure that we have the layout done correctly and that it corresponds to the schematic, we're going to use a highlighting tool to highlight different routes on the schematic and then make sure that we compare them to the same routes on the physical layout. So let's start with our Weenbridge network up above here, which consists of a series RC and a parallel RC network. And we'll be coming out of pin one on the op amp. So here we go in yellow, we will outline the area that we're going to follow. And you can see that uh, in addition to the two RC networks, we have a ground connection and we also have a connection that's going into the non-inverting input of the op amp. Okay, so let's start at pin one down here. Now no, remember now when you're looking at this package for the OP484, the dimple up in the upper left hand corner of the chip designates pin one. So we'll start here at pin one and work our way around through the Weenbridge network. So let's come out of here at pin one, go through a 10K resistor as we see up there for R1, and then through capacitor C1. And then capacitor C1 comes in contact with R2 and C2. And so we'll bring that across here. And we can see that both R R2 and C2 are connected now to the backside of C1. And we also notice that the bottom side of the 10K resistor connects to ground. Okay. And so <clears throat> this jumper here connects to the 10K resistor and ground. And we don't show the ground explicitly coming in from the M2K module, which we can show later. This jumper here that you see goes from this point to this point to pick up the uh, backside of capacitor C2. Okay, so we'll show that on there as well. Okay, so now we have everything included with R1C1's R2C2 in the Weenbridge network, except for the lead that goes into the non-inverting input to the amp. And this is the brown lead that we show here. And so we'll make sure that we can see that the non-inverting input to the amp is pin number three. And you can see that we're connecting to pin number three. All right. So now let's go back to our schematic and highlight the path also from pin number one through the negative feedback path. Okay. So we'll start here and uh, we'll just continue on down the line here so we can pick up these three components, the diode, D2, the diode D1, and resistor R4, okay? And of course, they form a parallel combination. Now, if we come out of pin one down here, we can see that 
The only other lead that's connected to pin 1 is this orange lead that extends clear to the opposite side of the board layout. Okay, and so we'll just come across here, come up on the orange lead here, all the way up to the top here, and across to where we pick up uh, components R4, D1, and D2. So here's D1, here's D2, and here's R4. And they're connected on to each other, as well as connecting to a 10K resistor R3. So let's go ahead and pick up that resistor R3. And uh, you can see that we picked that up there. And R3 also connects to a 4.7K ohm resistor. Okay. So we can see that uh, we're going to pick that up there. All right. And um, that 4.7K ohm resistor is uh, also connected to the top of the potentiometer R6. And if you look very closely here, that lead is going right in here. Okay. And so also there's a lead, this orange lead here, that meets at the junction of the R3, R5 combination and goes into the inverting input of our op amp, pin 2. So you can see that orange lead extends all the way from here, all the way along the back side here, and goes right into pin 2. All right. And then finally, we pick up the leads uh, coming through the R5 into R6, which is our potentiometer. And you can't see it very clearly, but if you look very carefully here, you'll see a jumper between the top pin and the swinger. So in this case here, we've done it a little bit differently than they show in the schematic. We put our short circuit between the top of R6 and the swinger on R6. And of course, then this lead here is not here. All right. And that bottom lead is, uh, is right here, which connects to this red lead that goes all the way back to what we're designating as ground. Okay. And as we can see here, that's that lead right there going all the way to ground. Okay. So now we have confirmed that the schematic diagram corresponds to the physical layout. And of course, now we, what we have not added are the leads that come in here. In fact, we could show, for example, there's a, a ground lead that comes in here. We can just bring it up here and I'll just sort of sketch it in here. Whoops, crazy end, huh? Okay, there's a ground lead. And uh, that would, of course, be the black lead from the M2K. And we also have a lead that comes into pin one, which is channel one of our oscilloscope. And we also have a lead that comes into pin three. So I guess I can put that up here somewhere. And that would be channel two of our oscilloscope. Okay, so in addition to that, we got to bring in some power leads. Here's V minus. And of course, V plus on the bottom side here on pin four. Okay. And the additional scope leads from the differential input for the scope. So the orange white lead and the blue light leads would also connect to this ground connection here, uh, providing a reference for our differential input channels on our oscilloscope. So this arrangement actually gives a much better way of looking at the physical layout. You'll notice that I did not use jumper wires that you have in your kit, uh, which you will use. But if I use jumper wires here, the leads are so long that it disguises many of the components underneath. And so I use custom uh, built 22 gauge copper wire and then strip the ends off of those copper wires and cut them to length so that we can see all the components on the board layout. So I hope this helps you in terms of doing a correspondence between your schematic diagram and the physical layout on your breadboard. Here we see a graphical representation of the layout using a tool called fritzing. I like to use this tool because we can explicitly see each of the conductors coming in and connecting to the uh, breadboard. Now this layout is a little bit different than the physical layout I showed in the photograph, 
but it clearly shows all of the leads coming in from the M2K module. So I hope you'll find this useful as well. We now introduce the circuit test portion of testing the Winbridge oscillator. We will use the M2K module and your computer with the Scopey to test the Winbridge oscillator. We'll begin by attaching the instrument wires to the circuit diagram as shown. First of all, the red lead is the plus 5 volt connected to the plus 5 volt setting. The white lead, which is sort of showing as gray here, but it's really supposed to be a white lead, uh, connects to the minus 5 volt lead on the setting. The orange lead, which is channel 1, is connected to the output of our Winbridge oscillator. The blue lead is connected to the intermediate junction of the Wienbridge circuit, designated as V+. So the orange-white, the blue-white, and the black leads all form the return path and signal ground. So the yellow-white lead is the corresponding differential input for the channel 1. The blue-white lead is a corresponding input for channel 2. And the black lead designates the ground signal. You can adjust the power supply to plus 5 and the minus power supply to minus 5 volts. You can temporarily remove the diodes D1 and D2. You can enable the plus and minus 5 volt supplies. And then while monitoring V out on the oscilloscope channel 1, adjust the potentiometer R6 until a sinusoidal waveform appears. We now begin the active circuit test of our Winbridge oscillator using the M2K instrument module. You can see before you now on the screen is a rendition of the oscilloscope and we have not activated any instruments along the way here. Let's begin with our power supply module and we begin by selecting it so you can see by by clicking on the name of the device, it activates its screen for setting purposes. If we take a look at this way of adjusting voltages, you can see I can take, there's a vernier dial that I can move down by using my scroll wheel on my mouse and set in a much finer detail. But if I click that orange button in the middle, turn it off, it becomes much more coarse and I can set it to anything in terms of one volt increments. The same thing happens down here with the minus five volt. So the first thing you want to do is set to plus and minus five volts on our power supply. And we won't activate it yet. We'll go up here and take a look at our oscilloscope. Notice how I clicked on the main bar there and the oscilloscope shows up on our system here. Um, I'm going to set this up for about a 200 microsecond uh, time base because we're going to be looking at about a one and a half kilohertz waveform. So a one kilohertz waveform would be one millisecond per division. So if we want to spread that waveform out a little bit, we'll spill out our, spread out our time base to about 200 microseconds. And once again, we can use the vernier controls on the scroll bar on our mouse, the scroll wheel on our mouse, to adjust the settings. If we go to the click and click the orange rate, we can adjust that to much more finer detail. So let's just go ahead and set it at 200 microseconds per division. And we can see that I have on my uh, channel one level diagram, two volts per division. I might start off with one volt per division. I'm not, not knowing what to expect when I actually get a waveform. And then we'll go into our channel two settings. And you can see we're once again set up for the same thing of 200 microseconds because those time bases will track each other for the two channels. And I'll set this one up for maybe a waveform setting of a, a half a volt per division because we know that that waveform should be about one third the output value. Okay. So I think we're pretty much close here, ready to get started to see what this thing's going to look like. So clearly, if I run the oscilloscope right now, I don't have a power supply active, so I wouldn't expect to see anything on the screen. And I can do that by going over here and clicking without changing the face of the oscilloscope and not ch clicking on the main bar of the power supply, just clicking in this little white window here, I can activate the power supply. And I still don't see any waveform. So it means I probably have to make an adjustment on resistor R6. So let's do that.
There it is. There's our waveform. And it looks like we're pretty big in terms of uh, screen size. So we can back off a little bit on our amplitude for um, uh, channel 2 and also for channel 1. So we're going to channel 1 and set him up for uh, maybe 2 volts per, per microsecond. And I think we, on our channel 2, we set it up for about, what, about a half a volt or something? No, it's a volt. So we'll do that for a half a volt. In fact, if we do it for two volts, just like we do channel two, we can see the one-third relationship between the output voltage, which is channel one, and the purple line here, which is indicating channel two. You can see it's about a one-third relationship as we expected. Now, we haven't really drawn or uh, set our potentiality for a real strong value. We just got the, th the thing oscillating, but let's see what happens as we increase the gain. Ah, we can now see some clipping developing on channel one. And of course, clipping is indicating that we're starting to approximate a, a square wave. And because the feedback network here, back through the Wainbridge section, is filtering the harmonics of the square wave, we don't get a perfect square wave, or in fact, we're not even getting a perfect square wave here, but you can see we're not nearly seeing the clipping that we're seeing in the output of channel one but we are seeing something which is heavily distorted on channel two. So that's the introduction of harmonic distortion. So let's go ahead and back off on our oscillator. And once again, we verified the fact that the ratio between the channel one and channel two is about one third. And if we adjust that so that it just starts oscillating, see it's a real touchy kind of thing here. Yeah, let's get it right there. There's hardly any distortion at all. But as we know, it's very difficult to hold that value. Any temperature change, any uh, variation in the gain of the amplifier, and that oscillator might just collapse and go away. Or it might, as it continues, as you can see, see we're starting getting a little bit of clipping here in the peaks here. And so we can't hold that gain very stable. So what we're going to do now is add our two diodes. And you can see what has happened here is that for that setting on the potentiometer, uh, we can see we don't see any visible distortion. Now, we can probably increase our sensitivity a little bit here. So we'll go up to channel 2 and double its sensitivity, and we'll also double the sensitivity for channel 1. And you can see that waveform doesn't look too bad now. So right at where the pot is just adjusted for oscillation, uh, the introduction of the diodes will, number one, stabilize the amplitude, and number two, it looks like it's reduced our distortion a little bit. Now, let's back off on our gain in our pot and see what happens. Okay, it goes away again. Okay, now, if I continue to gain that thing up, those diodes are starting to, st starting to work pretty hard now, and in fact, let's increase our voltage on our channel one to uh, two volts per division, and on channel two, uh, one volt per division, which we have. Okay, so we're okay there. And continue to see what happens as we uh, increase the gain. Okay, now we're starting to see clipping regardless of the influence of the diodes. We're driving the circuit so hard now that the diodes can't compensate for the fact that the amplitude is, the gain in the circuit is just too high. So, but once again, if we back off to the point where the oscillator just goes away, and then we crank up just a little bit forward. You can see we have a pretty good looking waveform there. And uh, things are looking all right. Now, the other thing to point out here is uh, here's our one volt per division on channel two. And we go back to channel one and we go uh, one volt per division. You can see we still have our one third relationship. So even though we have a nonlinear diode pair that's stabilizing our amplitude, the relationship between the input and output on the on the Wien bridge remains at one to three, okay, or three to one, I should say. Okay, so this completes the test of the Wien bridge oscillator, both with and without uh, diode correction for amplitude stabilization. Now, one of the things that we're going to be looking at in the uh, extra exercises, which I'm not going to have any lab 
for you uh, on, I'm just going to describe it here, is we're going to be looking at the transfer function from the output of the channel back through the Weinbridge network. That would be from the two terminals that we discussed previously where we see the one-third relationship. And we're going to use the network analyzer. See, we fire up the network analyzer in order to do that. Now, in order to make that system work, we're going to have to add the signal generator uh, to the output so we can drive that channel back through the Weinbridge network. But at the same time, we want to isolate it from the output of the op amp. So we'll temporarily remove the first resistor in that's connected to the output of the op amp and then drive that with our signal generator and take a look at the network analyzer in terms of the response. And we should get what we see on the slide which has been provided. Number two, we can take a look at how much harmonic distortion is introduced by using the spectrum analyzer. Okay, uh, You can use the spectrum analyzer to uh, examine the waveform. Let's see here. Now we can see that the spectrum analyzer is showing us uh, not much information because look, we have a bandwidth that goes clear over 50 megahertz. So we we'll want to go up here and we want to set that uh, range so that we, we're expecting signals about one and a half kilohertz. So let's go ahead and start this thing at, oh, maybe uh, we'll start it at maybe uh, 100 hertz and then go to uh, um, maybe one kilohertz or something like that. So we come over here, adjust it for, let's make it three kilohertz, see what happens. Okay, uh, that's three kilohertz. And uh, <clears throat> you can see that we're centered right around <clears throat> the dominant <clears throat> uh, signal, which is our 1.59 kilohertz signal associated with our wind bridge. And then you can see some harmonics on either side, okay? And so if we take, um, maybe take this and spread it out just a little bit, maybe make it five kilohertz and make this uh, 500 hertz. Okay. And now you can start seeing that here is our dominant uh, fundamental sinusoid signal. And we're getting some harmonics out here. And these harmonics are indications of distortion. And so as we continue to crank up our signal here, we'll crank that up again here, we'll see some additional harmonics showing up. Now look at the harmonics showing up. We're getting all kinds of garbage showing up. And uh, there's one here. It's, it's, uh, here you can see we're about 1.59 uh, uh, kilohertz is our fundamental. And you can see out here about twice the fundamental, okay? Uh, which would be 2x, about right around 3 kilohertz. We're getting a, a harmonic, and that's due to the fact that the diodes are nonlinear and they generate all of these harmonic components. And here's another one at the third harmonic out here. And so th that tends to be associated with odd harmonics generated by a square wave. Okay, so now if we back off on our gain, you can see it's going to start coming down until we get to the point where maybe the whole waveform collapses. If we lose that fundamental, we're getting close now. Lose that fundamental, ooh, we just lost it. Okay, so now we want to crank up ever so slowly, and that's about as good as we're going to get in terms of harmonic distortion. We've got a big peak out here occurring at the third harmonic, which means there is some uh, odd order harmonic generation being handled. But here is minus 20, relative to minus 50. So that's 30, the first, the first major harmonic is 30 dB down. Okay, so we'll let this uh, complete our active test mode. We will now complete our pre-lab video by looking at a couple of advanced topics that you can explore on your own. We can use the spectrum analyzer to examine the distortion as, as we saw in some of the hands-on lab video. We can also use the network analyzer to examine the actual frequency response of the Weinbridge network. 
we will see some results of these approaches on the last slides. And we will attach the M2K module similarly to as we've done before by connecting the red and white power leads, the orange and blue, blue scope leads, and the uh, reference black lead to the ground. As, and then we can adjust our power supply to plus and minus 5 volts to begin these exploration studies that you can do on your own. For example, with the uh, spectrum analyzer, the power supply and everything is set up very similarly. And with the network analyzer, we're going to remove uh, this lead from the output on resistor R1, and then we'll drive that node with the waveform generator W1. So that's how we'll hook up for network analysis. This is what the spectrum analyzer might look like for a sweep that we're conducting over 50 hertz to 5 kilohertz. And you can see the fundamental component being right around 1.59 uh, kilohertz, which is the uh, single fundamental sinusoid being generated by our system, as well as some harmonic distortion that we can see being generated by the nonlinearities in the network. Finally, the network analyzer typical response is shown here as uh, we examine the frequencies between 500 hertz and 300 or 3 kilohertz. And you can see the peaking that is, in fact, uh, occurring at about 1.59 uh, kilohertz and the phase uh, at that point is in fact zero degrees. So we're confirming the fact that the Wayne Bridge network is performing as expected. So use this as sort of a reference slide when you're doing your network analyzer exploration. Now the real important thing that we want to leave you with is you now have a test bed and a parts kit that you can explore. So take some time to tinker around with your module, find out uh, some areas that maybe you would have liked to explore it in the past and really didn't have the test instrumentation to do so. For example, building a simple resistor voltage divider or measuring the actual power supply voltage using the voltmeter or exploring new circuits or devices that you maybe wanted to explore in the past but didn't have the capability to test. So this is your chance to do it. Well, we hope you enjoyed this pre-lab video and if you have any questions, you certainly have an email address to contact me. And I hope you enjoy your workshop experience. Thank you.